We're gonna call today's video Nature's Bookshelf. And I bet you there's a few gems and really unique ones in here you haven't come across. I'm gonna be sharing some of my absolute favorite books I've come across over the years as it relates to things like foraging, mushrooms, uh, general kind of nature awareness and ecology. And I'm even gonna get into some, a couple topics around kind of growing food and self-reliance, uh, a couple fiction books and uh, a couple books around, we'll just call it reconciling relationships, which is also an important topic as it relates to all these things. Now, if you wanna look ahead and see which books I'm actually gonna be chatting about, you can go down to the description where I list the books there as well as links as to where to get them. And you can also jump around throughout the video if there's certain categories that interest you more than others. But you might enjoy just listening to the whole thing. I'll try and be pretty quick about it because I'm gonna explain what makes these such gems and why I like them. I will also mention, you know, with the holiday season coming up, well, depending on when you're watching this, if you are interested in buying any of these books, first off, I'd say please go and buy it from a local bookstore if that's an option for you to have them ordered. Uh, a lot of small businesses are really struggling with today's economy and it really means the world to them if you can go in and buy them. If you're not gonna buy it from a small bookstore though and you are gonna order it through Amazon, then please use the links below as I do get a small um, affiliate payout for any of the purchases that come through those links and it's much appreciated. Now I'm sure you have some gems as well that you think should be on this list and I would love to hear what they are. Why don't we get a master list going? So throw your favorite books along these categories down in the comments below. Now before I dive into the books, I just want to quickly introduce myself in case you don't know me already. My name is Chris Gilmore and I run chrisoutdoors.ca and Chris Outdoors is really about helping people deepen their connection to the natural world, deepen their knowledge and understanding of ecology, as well as develop their skill set uh, both as far as the outdoors, self-reliance, growing food, emergency preparedness. Uh, and really, we're all about a kind of holistic skill set for preparing for changing times in a changing world that's rooted in nature and healthy practices and thoughts. So if that kind of stuff interests you, I invite you to go over and check out chrisoutdoors.ca. I've got an awesome newsletter that goes out once a month uh, with free information. I list classes and stuff that are coming up. Uh, and share all kinds of free teachings in there as well. And of course, you can always follow me on social media at chrisoutdoorson and consider subscribing to this channel. So I'll try and go through these fairly quick because there's quite a few books I wanna go through here. We're gonna go through them by category. And the first one we're gonna talk about or the first category is around plants and foraging. And the first book in that category, chosen as the first book on purpose, is this one right here. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer. Uh, this is a phenomenal book around, oh, here, the tagline is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Uh, and I really, really love this one. Robin does a beautiful job of kind of bridging philosophy with Indigenous wisdom and the sciences together. And I think this is just a really great foundational piece to read uh, as you're starting to develop your relationship with the plant world. And of course, it's amazing to be able to support an Indigenous author doing such great work in the world. From there, if you want to get into actually foraging for plants, the first thing we need to think about beyond stewardship, and Robin Wall Kimmer lays out a good foundation for stewardship in the way that we approach plants from a relational perspective, but the next thing that we want to think about is safety. I think this book here should be on everybody's bookshelf if you want to get into foraging. It's the Peterson's Field Guide to Venomous Animals and Poisonous Plants. You want to learn your poisonous plants first. The next one that I think is really good before you start thinking about can I eat it or what can I eat, you should really have a solid understanding of botany and plant families. And this is one of the best books I've ever read. Now, botany might sound like a boring topic, but Thomas J. Elpel actually makes the topic fascinating and fun in this book. It's not even that thick of a book and it's absolutely brilliant the way he helps you understand how to look at a plant. So here's one of the problems. You know, you can go and buy yourself a plant identification book and there's literally hundreds, maybe thousands of plants in there. And you know, if you go and be like, okay, well this plant has a red flower and you open up this book, well, there could be 50 plants with a red flower in that book. Thomas Elpel teaches you how to look at some of the characteristics of the plant and go from it being a thousand possible species down to one small group, makes your ID way faster. And it really just helps you understand kind of the uh, interconnectedness and the role of uh, plants playing ecology in our planet fascinating book, really, really well worth the read. Uh, it's called Botany in a Day by Thomas uh, J. Elpel. Uh, I can touch on these ones next. For those of you that are in uh, Canada or the eastern part of North America, uh, these are some great books. These are actually available on our other website, wildmuskoka.com. So again, if you want to support somebody small with your book purchases instead of Amazon, go over to wildmuskoka.com and we have some of these lone pine, gu lone pine guides. Uh, they've got a great Mushrooms of Ontario guide. 
uh, edible and medicinal plants of Canada, plants of Southern Ontario, uh, and they really do make uh, pretty good comprehensive guides. These are more around the identification side, but these are the Lone Pine guides. And again, wildmuskoka.com. Okay, now let's dive into foraging. This one here, uh, Samuel Thayer, or Thayer, is somebody you can absolutely trust. He walks the walk, uh, talks the talk, uh, has put in so much time. He's written a ton of books, and he's very respected in the wild foods community. you got to be careful when you're buying wild food books, especially off of the internet. How much is the person that wrote the book or wrote the article? You know, how experienced are they? How well do they really, really know it? Samuel knows his stuff. This book has fun little antidotes. It has great stories in it. But it also has very comprehensive information about a ton of plants. And this book is specific on the foraging and how to actually use those plants. Okay, now let's get a little bit into um, foraging and preparing those foods and those plants that we're learning about. Here I love because it's a Canadian author. author. It's a real gem. Uh, her name is Beverly Gray and it's called The Boreal Herbal. Uh, wild food and medicine plants from the north. So this one is more applicable to people living uh, kind of in those central and more northern latitudes. We live in Muskoka, Ontario, and tons of these plants are here. Even southern Ontario, you're going to find a good number of these plants. And probably even a lot of the northern states are going to have a good number of these plants on them as well. But the Boreal Herbal, uh, I love this because she weaves in stories. There's beautiful pictures in there. She talks about her relationship with the plants. And she has all kinds of suggestions for what to do with plants, both for food and medicine in here. Uh, great diagrams, phenomenal all-around book, The Boreal Herbal. Okay, the next topic we're going to go into, which is a really trending one these days, and that's around mushrooms. So some of you know that I uh, have a course on how to grow mushrooms, as well as how to identify them in the, uh, the woods. You can actually go to themushroomcourse.com uh, and check out that course if you're interested. And if you use the code uh, YouTube30, you'll actually get $30 off that. I'll put the link for that below. But here's my favorite book on growing mushrooms is this one right here. It's called Organic Mushroom Farming and Mycoremediation by Trad Cotter is the name of the book. Um, this is, uh, has phenomenal pictures. It has really clear step-by-step -step instructions. It will take you every step of the way through how to grow mushrooms at home uh, using all kinds of techniques, uh, low budget and higher budget options, uh, really worth checking out. From there, we'll talk about mushrooms in the wild. You gotta be really careful when it comes to foraging mushrooms. There's quite a number of toxic mushrooms, there's a handful of deadly poisonous ones, and they can be really hard to tell apart from edible mushrooms so far. This is a fairly new book out this year, and this is, I think, absolutely brilliant the way it's uh, been written. It's one of my favorite beginner mushrooming books I've come across. It's called Mushrooming Without Fear, The Beginner's Guide to Collecting Safe and Delicious Mushrooms. Uh, Alexander Schwab is the name. Uh, I can't recommend this book highly enough. Basically, it's kind of like Botany in the Day by Thomas Elpel, where he teaches you to actually look at the mushroom groups and the characteristics and the patterns, and then shows you, you know, which mushroom patterns and groups are the safest to start with when you're getting into foraging. Now, this one's a little bit different, but interesting. You may have been hearing about the roles that mushrooms are playing in medicine for humans, but they also are amazing medicines for the earth. And this book here is called Earth Repair, a grassroots guide to healing toxic and damaged landscapes. It's actually a friend of mine that wrote this book. She did a phenomenal job. And she's talking about things like micro-remediation. How do you actually work with mycelium and the fungi realm to actually clean up toxins, like pull heavy metals out of soils, clean up oil spills, uh, as well as working with uh, bacteria, plants, other things of that nature. Um, basically working with the earth to heal toxic landscapes. Now let's dive into the category of just general nature awareness and ecology. Nature's year, changing seasons in central and eastern Ontario. Now, don't get hung up on the central and eastern Ontario part of this book. If you're on the eastern side of North America, of like kind of Canada and the US, this book is probably relevant for, relevant for you anywhere in those eastern woodlands. I've never come across a book quite like this before. Uh, it's beautiful. So he basically goes through month by month of the year and then goes through categories like birds, mammals, insects, fish, weather, and lays out what's happening in the early part of that month. And it's literally so early January, mid-January, late January, uh, by insects, birds, fish, water. It's so brilliant. And when you read about it in here and you go outside, it actually helps you to know what to look for. So you're actually able to witness some of these uh, miracles of ecology with your own eyes. This is an amazing book. It's a real gem. Another author in this general ecology topic that I like, and I don't even know which of his books to pick. Uh, you should just check out the list of them and then see which of the topics interest you. But his name's Tristan Gooley. He has a phenomenal story. 
um, you know, of all the things that he's accomplished with his life. The first book I came across of his was called The Natural Navigator. And it's talking about how things in nature can actually help you navigate, you know, basically find north, find your way home, or find yourself from point A to point B without a compass. How do you use nature as a compass? But he's got another book like that called The Secret World of Weather. It's all about reading the story and the weather, just how to read nature, how to read a tree, how to read water. His natural knowledge is, it's mind blowing. You know, it almost feels superhuman, his understanding of the natural world and these really subtle cycles and that subtle story going on all around us. So I highly recommend checking out some of, uh, some of Tristan Gooley's books. Now, if you've been following me for a little while, you know that I'm a huge fan of what we call tracking or wildlife tracking. And wildlife tracking is really about reading the story written in the footprints. And when I say the story, you know, I don't just mean identifying it and saying, oh, well, that was this. So that was a raccoon or that was a deer or that was a bear. It's actually what do those tracks actually tell us about that animal's life and what it was doing, where it is now, and about reading the overall story in the natural landscape. So a couple of my favorite tracking books. Uh, the first one I'm going to start with right here is by an author, Paul Resendez, and it's called Tracking and the Art of Seeing. And it's so much more than just a field guide. You know, you can get field guides that are just like pictures of tracks and measurements. They're valuable for sure. But this one actually weaves in stories, information about the, the animals themselves, really cool pictures. Uh, it's very different than your typical tracking field guide. And that's why I picked it for this list. Tracking in the Art of Seeing by Paul Renendez. And while we're on that topic, I'll just mention if you're looking for a really good just book to read, he has a book called The Wild Within. His story is fascinating. He basically went from being a hardcore uh, biker, you know, criminally involved biker, to somebody that uh, was actually a world-renowned wildlife photographer, an author, and teaching wildlife tracking. And it was his relationship with nature that actually pulled him out of some of um, these, you know, challenging spaces that he put himself into. The Wild Within is him telling stories about his relationship with the land um, and how it formed and shaped him as a person. So highly recommend this if you're just looking for inspiring stories that will also teach you a ton about the natural world. Now when it comes to actual tracking field guides, my hands down favorite is Mark Elbrock's Mammal Track and Sign. This one is a little bit expensive, you can see it's quite uh, thick, but it's it's mind blowing how much detail. Like I've never come across a tracking book that even goes close to this as far as um, the different layers of topics that he puts in here. From looking at animals' movement and the patterns in their tracks and that telling you, say, how fast they're moving. Um, you know, for example, when you look at an actual picture of a track, a lot of field guides will have a drawn picture or they'll have, let's say, a picture in snow. But the problem is, how often do you actually find that perfect track in snow? This one will show the picture in mud, show it in snow, show it in leaves. Um, it's got pictures of animal holes. It's got pictures of chews on acorns. Like, it is so comprehensive. Um, I, it is just hands down my top actual field guide when it comes to wildlife tracking. Again, that's Mammal Track and Sign by Mark Elbrock. Okay, we're getting really close to the end here. Only a couple categories left. So on the realm of food and self-reliance, I'm just going to highlight two books. There's so many I could pick out on this topic. But the first one I want to share is called The Resilient Gardener. And this one just seems really relevant to our time. If you're serious about self-reliance and you're actually thinking about, you know, being able to provide your family for food, provide your family with food during potentially challenging times. That's what this book is all about. You know, a lot of us grow food in gardens, but it's completely reliant on the infrastructure around us to hold it up. You know, basically outside resources coming in. It's also reliant on us having an abundance of time. And if something comes up, like we get sick, we're not actually able to put the work in to grow that food. Uh, Carol, who wrote this book, actually had a, a pretty interesting epiphany uh, about her garden. She was a renowned gardening expert and she realized that how unresilient her garden actually was when she went through a family health crisis. And it made her really rethink how we design gardens so that the gardens are resilient and that they can support us through challenging times and times when we don't have a ton of time on our hand. So the philosophical part of this book I find very relevant to the modern times, but then it's also got really just, you know, straight up tips for how to design a more resilient garden. Once you've designed the Resilient Garden, the next thing you want to think about is food preservation. And this is huge. This is one of the areas that my wife and I are really working on this year as far as, you know, increasing our own self-reliance. Um, and the book I'm going to recommend, it's a new one that just came out, Melissa K. Norris, Everything Worth Preserving. This lady is an absolute wealth of knowledge. I actually know her personally. Uh, we've done a couple podcasts together and some webinars together. Um, 
But this book, everything from uh, making jerky to canning to lacto ferments to drying, um, this one is just a wealth of knowledge full of recipes on how to actually preserve that garden food so that you actually can grow a year round food and have it there for you in the off season. So can't recommend that enough. Okay, the last two books I want to hit on are in the realm of um, Indigenous Reconciliation, as well as uh, a fun fiction one as well. I'll start with the fiction one because it's a fun one. Uh, fun one if you're into kind of like apocalyptic uh, preparedness like stories. So Wob Rice uh, wrote this book. It's, this is the second one here. It's called Moon of the Turning Leaves. Uh, Moon of the Crested, or sorry, Moon of the Crusted Snow was his first one. Uh, and what I love about this book, one, it's uh, a Canadian based book uh, talking about the north of Canada. Uh, the storyline actually seems, you know, somewhat realistic in some ways, or aspects of the storyline actually seem very realistic to me. And it gets you thinking about, you know, in a worst case scenario, what might you actually do? What might actually play out? And then, of course, he weaves in a beautiful Indigenous perspective uh, and some Indigenous wisdom into that book as well. I actually haven't read Moon of the Turning Leaves yet. My wife just finished it, so I'm excited to dig into this one. Um, and, you know, by buying a book like this, you're also supporting an amazing Indigenous and Canadian author. So I appreciate that part. And then our last book here is on the topic of reconciliation, which I do believe is actually related to everything that we do in the outdoors. You know, tending relationships with the land, tending relationships with people, tending relationships with the past and the present. That's where the reconciliation piece uh, comes in. So this one here is uh, called Indigenous Relations by Bob Joseph. But his first book, uh, I don't actually have it right now because I lent it out to a friend, but it's called 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. I feel like every Canadian should read this book, and it would probably be very relevant if you live in the U.S. as well. The Indian Act is, um, you know, a very significant piece of legislation that has impacted millions of people and the history of this country. Uh, there's a lot of injustices in it. There's a lot of controversy, and a lot of it is still very relevant today in the way that it's playing out. And I didn't learn about this in school. I knew very little about it until I read the book. So as somebody that lives in Canada... Um, who lives in the traditional territories of many different Indigenous communities. I think it's really important and our responsibility to understand that history. So 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act is a really great foundational piece in kind of understanding some of that history. And this is his follow-up Indigenous Relations, uh, Insights, Tips, and Suggestions to Make Reconciliation a Reality. So I hope you enjoyed those. Uh, if you've got some favorites that you'd like to add, please add them to the comments below. I would love to uh, check some of those out and maybe we can just get a big, long master tally list going on there. Again, think about subscribing to the channel. And if you haven't been over to my Chris Outdoors website yet, it's chrisoutdoors.ca. And please consider joining the newsletter if you like this because I send out monthly newsletters that are very educational around uh, deepening our relationship with the land, natural awareness, survival, preparedness, homesteading, um, all those kinds of things. So hope you enjoyed that video and I'll sign off.